we created a market research discipline in a very small company. We were at the time easily under 100 people and we had a robust research discipline that powered the product decisions we made simply because we wanted to make sure we were making the right choices that actually met the needs of our customers, not building products because we thought oh, this was a cool feature or this was a cool tagline. We're going to use that to market our products. So I, I, I cannot, you know, this is one of the things I bring with me in every role. And quite frankly, anytime I take a job, understanding leadership's focus on the customer is an incredibly important criteria for me. I, I don't, I don't even want to take a job if there isn't care or thought to that question. Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples, not just trending ideas or buzzword laden schmaltz, real world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. Look, I've got an ego. I'll admit it. I certainly do. Hey, I'm in content and marketing to high ego industries, but I've learned this lesson in my career. So much more is possible when I can get that darn ego out of the way. So I loved hearing my next guest talk about how she learned the lesson, your customer is your most important stakeholder. Now, anyone can say that, of course, but she backs it up with fascinating stories of how she very humbly, humbly, very diligently has lived that lesson and I'll just shove that ego out of the way a bit, probably. So joining me now to share that story and many more lesson-filled stories, please welcome Radhika Dougal, Chief Marketing Officer at Super. Thanks for joining us, Radhika. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to just cherry pick from your, your LinkedIn, from your past career real quick, so people know who I'm talking to. You're a manager of Deloitte Consulting. You're a senior marketing manager at Pfizer. You're a managing director and chief marketing officer of growth financial products at Chase. Uh, you've been an adjunct, an adjunct professor at Baruch College, Yeshiva University, and right now at NYU. You've managed budgets of over $100 million, and right now you are chief marketing officer at Super, where you are managing a team of over 30. And uh, for those who are uninitiated, Super is a fintech company that helps consumers save money. It's backed by Novia Capital, Line Capital, MBA star Steph Curry, and several other venture capital firms. It's raised over $100 million in funding and surpassed $1 billion in sales, billion with a B. So that's a lot right there. What is your day like as chief marketing officer at Super? What does this mean for the marketer? Well, thank you for that, that introduction. Um, I'm going to say what so many others on your podcast have said before me, which is no two days the same. And that's the absolute best part. So I tend to wake up very early. I wake up at four in the morning um, and I use the quiet time to write documents that require real thought. We have like a prolific written culture where we actually take time to write our thoughts out so that when we go to meetings, we're prepared. I use that quiet time in the morning to review some of the documents my team creates or review creative. Um, and then I spend the rest of the morning with my daughter, taking her to school, getting her dressed. Um, I chat with my mom every day. And then I head back into my bedroom where I spend the morning and the afternoon, typically in back-to-back -back meetings. And I actually prefer that because I like having the time in meetings and then the quiet time to do work. Um, and the time with meetings these days, especially in my role at Super, is filled with some really exciting projects. So as I've mentioned before, we are renaming and rebranding the company. We just launched a product called Super Cash, which is essentially a credit building card for literally everyone. And I spend my time in those meetings helping my team get unblocked, reviewing creative, uh, working with cross-functional stakeholders to make sure our products or our brand are what we want them to be. Um, and then I try to have at least two hours at the end of the day, again, quiet time, do work before spending some time with my daughter and, and my husband. You know, I love that prolific written culture. That is so cool. And like the prep you put in for meetings, you know, I was talking to someone the other day and they said, Hey, I didn't go to this meeting. They said you should have been. And I'm like, well, what was on the agenda? Like if, if you, and they're like, agenda didn't even go out. And like, how many meetings does everyone have on their books now? There's not even an agenda. You don't even know what's covered. So I love that prolific written culture where you're thinking through your day and your team is, I'm like, okay, how are we going to make the most value of the, out of this day? That's, that's great. We need more of that reflection in our lives. I think Radhika. Um, I tend not to go if there's not an agenda. That's a great, yeah, that's a great lesson. What are we talking about? Why do you need me there? Uh, well, let's look at some of you, very, very interesting career. Let's look at some of the lessons you've learned from your career, from some of the things you made in marketing. And first, you say people think you need vastly different skills in startups versus large companies, but it's not true. 
So tell us why you think this isn't true, Rudy. I know you have backgrounds in both. Yeah. And I, you know, I wouldn't even attribute this to one particular person. I would just attribute this to the different experiences I've had. But I've worked across management consulting, Fortune 100 companies, um, and startups. And what I've learned from all those experiences is the skills you need to be successful are actually the same. So some of the skills you need, the ability to influence without authority, for example. Even if you come in with a title, like I joined Super as the CMO back in January, your title doesn't matter. You've got to come in every day and you've got to prove that you're worthy of that title, especially when you're new. People don't know what they're capable of. So you get quick wins, you demonstrate your capability, whether you have a title or, or not. Influencing without authority is critical in any environment. The second is really having a genuine desire to see others' point of view and consider them, really consider them, and then respectfully be able to articulate your point of view. That is so important, whether you're a consultant talking to your client, right? You're in the meeting trying to disagree with your client, or you are in a startup trying to bring your big, cult, your big company perspective into the meeting, and you're going to have to articulate, well, why is that antiquated big company thing something that's important? Well, big companies are big for a reason, right? They get there for a reason. So really being able to consider others' point of view and being able to respectfully articulate yours. Genuine care for people, right? I feel very strongly that if you understand and care for the people you're with, you're not only going to enjoy work more, but you're going to be better at it. And then the last is just like hustle and grit and determination and being able to push through and figure things out. And so if you take a step back, if those are the skills... Well, why is it the same in every environment? Well, it's just because every environment is made of people and people are the same everywhere. And in every environment, we have the same challenges. We have limited time and money. We all have our own perspectives. Almost every industry I've worked in has been highly competitive. The problems are the same and the people are the same. So the skills aren't vastly different. So I agree. I think there's a lot of good points and, um, you know, we talk about, I've worked in B2B for a long time. We talk about these organizations in B2B and business to business. And it's really not, right? It's, they're organizations, but they're people in there. That's who we're talking to. But let me ask, taking the, the other view too, are there some things that people who have had a career in large companies that would help if they worked in a startup or small company and vice versa? If you worked in a small company, like, yeah, but it would help if you had this large company experience. I'll give you two of my own experiences. I don't want to hear of yours. But one, I was interviewing on the How I Made It in Marketing podcast at Julian Rio, the assistant vice president of international marketing at Ring Central, big multi billion dollar company. And he said having startup experience is incredibly valuable. And he told a story about working for a startup, they didn't have budgets. So he would just go out on the streets, beat the streets, have leaflets, hand them out. And he really learned to interact directly with people. And he wouldn't have done that if he had that big budget. Now, it's interesting because some of your stories, you did that for a very big company. So that doesn't stop you. Um, but then also, just from my own experience, uh, you know, having to work with, with very, very large companies, one thing I really learned is navigation, right? So I started my career in an agency. Agencies, you know, they're smaller than odds big. And then I worked with some, with some Fortune 500 companies and as a, as a contractor, as a consultant and having them as a client. And I really had to learn how to navigate, which is something I hadn't realized previously. I was, had been talking directly to decision makers, right? Matrixed organizations, there's decision makers, there's accompanying organizations, there's you're working in marketing, there's sales, there's so much involved there. And I think that's paid off, you know, for me later in my career when I even, again, worked at smaller companies, but you always are working probably with a bigger company or with a smaller company. So knowing how to navigate within those partners, within those vendors, helps make you better at working with those. So I just wonder your thoughts. Like, absolutely very good points. We're all people. These people skills are critical. But is there something specific? If you've worked, if there's someone working in a large company their whole career, where you'd say, go in a startup because you need to learn this. Or if they've worked in startups all their career, yeah, look, just take a, take a two-year break. Work in a large company. You're going to get this out of it. Yeah, you know, I would say maybe three things. The first is, I have been very intentional about making sure I've had both experiences in my career for exactly what you've said. I actually thought that I would have, I would develop vastly different skill sets in these two places. And I was wrong. What I feel I have figured out how to do by having these different experiences, and what I hope others have the opportunity to do if they do work in different environments, is learn how to build from scratch and build for scale. That is something that is very different. Right? When you're building something in a startup and you're employee number 40 or 20 or something like that, you are really building something from scratch. You are the person keying in your own Facebook campaign, pulling the data in Google Analytics. When you are at a larger company, 
you not only can be building from scratch, as I've had the opportunity to do, but you are not building from scratch for 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 users. You're building for 5 million, 20 million users. So I do feel that having both of those experiences is incredibly important. So I would encourage everybody to go work in these different types of environments because I think it is really beneficial. But I want to comment on your point about, well, some one of the other guests you've had on the show has said, well, you get the opportunity to work directly with people at a smaller company. I think this is just a personality thing. You get the opportunity to work directly with people if you want it and you can figure out how to do it. So I'll share an example of a time at a big company where I've had this opportunity. So I had the opportunity to work at J.P. Morgan Chase at, in the Chase Consumer Bank. I had the opportunity to work on the launch of a banking product for underserved consumers called Chase Secure Banking. And as part of that, I said, well, I'm not an underserved consumer. Quite frankly, I'm probably an overserved consumer of banking <laughs> products. So I wanted to put myself in the shoes of the consumer. And we did, we did great market research. And we had great support from research teams. But it didn't feel like enough. I wasn't getting to interact with the consumer. I wasn't understanding. So I live in New York City. I stood outside Western Unions and Payomatics and asked customers of those institutions, why are you here? What is the benefit of being here? Hey, do you know you can get this service at a bank? I really just wanted to understand why people made the choices they made, what they needed from that institution. And I was so able to take that knowledge back to my work at Chase and figure out how to work that into either the product with our product team or the messaging. And I just think you can do that regardless of the institution. And by the way, you should be doing that. If we get to it, I'll share how I've actually been able to take that lesson of really putting yourself in your customer's shoes. In my current role at Super, we asked the entire company to do that. And we spent a whole day doing that together in Las Vegas because that is so incredibly important. Well, let's, let's cover that real quick because that's a great point. You know, I, it's funny. I had I'd thought of that question written because I thought of this interview. And then later I saw from some of the stories you shared, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> she chose to do this. She didn't have to. She was working at Chase. She chose to do this, which is fascinating. It does bring up the point, even though we don't have to do certain things, we can certainly choose to do them. Um, but I want to ask you about that because, you know, famous example from GM, for example. Famous example, you know, GM was known at the time for lesser quality than Toyota. Well, GM's executives supposedly had special cars. They weren't they're just regular cars that came off the line. They had special cars made just for them, and they were not having the quality issues that the general consumer was having, right? They did they specifically, because of working in this big company, being a big executive, they chose to separate themselves from their consumers. In hindsight, maybe a big mistake. They didn't really understand their consumer experience. So what are you doing in Super? How are you trying to get in the customer's shoes? We'll get into this later. As you mentioned, this is also, I, I think, you're, you're targeting um, sometimes maybe a less affluent group, a different person than yourself, always different to put yourself in the, in the customer's shoes in that case. So what are some of the things you're doing with your team? It, that's absolutely right. And, and I think the notion that we're targeting a group that's different than many of our employees, not all, but many of our employees, is the grounding point in, in this story. So we are targeting a less affluent consumer. And we are hoping to make meaningful difference in their lives. And I feel very strongly that in order to do that, you have to understand what their life is like. And I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't been a less affluent consumer in quite some time. Um, And so we did two things. The first thing we did at Super is just flat out try to understand who our customers were. So we did qualitative and quantitative market research, just like you do at every company. 3,000 folks in a quant survey to get statistical significance, 75 qualitative interactions with video diaries and focus groups that we got to be a part of and we got to watch. And we created a beautiful deck that said, who's your design target and who's your consumption target and lots of facts and figures. And then we presented that deck. And it resonated with some folks. And it didn't resonate with most folks. Like, let's be honest, it was a piece of paper. Because people couldn't put themselves in the shoes of their customer. So what we did... then to kind of take that a step further is, and kudos to our co-founders for pushing us to do this, by the way. Um, What we did is we said, okay, we're having a whole company offsite. We had this offsite in August of this past year. We all went to Las Vegas, 200 plus people in Las Vegas um, from Super. And we took eight hours. We took eight hours to walk in the shoes of our customers. We created a Google Sites website, a little bit janky, created by yours truly and a couple of folks on the team. And um, 
one of the pages of that site was, okay, put yourself in this person's shoes. This person was a persona from our design target. It was a, it was a woman who had two children who had $40,000 household income, which was $737 a week post-tax. So we said, here's who you are. Then we said, build a budget with your $737, build a grocery list and meal plan to feed your family of three. And we created these activities very intentionally. We gave each group that was doing this activity uh, a paper check and said, go to the check casher and cash this check. And then go to Walmart and buy groceries with that cash. I'm pretty sure many of us had never been to a check casher. Many of us in the recent past haven't used cash to pay for their groceries. Many of us hadn't experienced you only have this set amount of money. So you have to make trade-offs and you're going to run out before you can, I'm making this up, buy your child the shoes that they want. And then you're going to have to have that fictitious conversation. What was so powerful about that was not the eight hours spent but the debrief afterwards. We spent about an hour to an hour and a half afterwards, if I remember right, with people, open mic forum, all of us in a room together, just talking about what did we not know prior to this exercise and what did we learn and how did we feel? And I gotta tell you, coming out of that exercise, I no longer hear things like, oh, we should make this feature or we should say it this way because that's what resonates with me or that's what I need people understand who we're solving for, who we're building things for, and who we're writing copy for. And we're all laser focused now on making an impact. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. I'll tell you why, because, you know, I think maybe that would be the knock on consulting, right? That consulting background is like beautifully researched PowerPoint, you know, thoroughly researched, all this info being delivered in a gorgeous conference room with catered food and everyone flown in and all these things, right? And so it's so disjunctive between who the customer is and your, your ability and experience that. And I would say too, so everyone diving in like that's really helpful. Even that small minor lesson, a small minor way to do that is, this is some knock I've always gotten. You know, I started my career as a, as a copywriter. So I'd write sometimes these, you know, long copy ads. And then the designers would be like, well, I would never read that long copy. Like, no, let's just cut it. It doesn't look good in the design. But you always have to think of, you know, my always retort would always be, well, I don't care if you would read it. <laughs> You're not the customer. And that's the brutal thing we have to say when we look in the mirror or to our teams. I really don't care how you would feel. You're not the customer. Let's put ourselves in the customer's shoes. And in the long copy case, or in, and what you're talking about, probably also in some, um, you know, are you going to use Discord or apps or whatever the latest thing is on the fastest phone? Um, because that's what we care about. You have to give that knock and say like, well, if you're the customer, if you're struggling through, let's say your refrigerator broke this morning, well, then, yeah, maybe you do care about refrigeration and want to read a lot of long copy. Or again, if you're that own your bank consumer, poor consumer, well, maybe you don't have the newest phone and the fastest phone. And, you know, the, we don't want to give them the latest app or the latest network. So there's no better way. Like, yeah, we can deliver this beautiful presentation that says that and, and we can kind of think it. But there's no better way than, my gosh, you gave me eight hours to live it. <laughs> that is fantastic. You gave me eight hours to live it. Well, and what's so important is that it's in every decision you make, actually. It's not just marketing. It's not just product. It's every operational decision you make. If you can get every person in the company to think like your customer or realize what would your customer do in this scenario, then you can start to build every interaction for the right person. That's great. Uh, let's look at one of your next lessons. And when I first, vend it, when I first read it, I got to admit, I thought you were talking about vendors. <laughs> and when you're talking about vendors, you know, your marketing agencies or tech platforms, whatever, it was still a great lesson. But when I actually got into it, I love that you kind of went in your personal life here. So you said your partner is your most important career choice. So this isn't a PR agency. What are you talking about here? Oh, no, I, I'm not talking about an agency. I'm talking about my husband. Um, <laughs> so I, I feel very strongly that over the past 15 years, the most important choice I've made in my career was marrying my husband. Um, and I, this probably only applies if you choose to have a partner, by the way. If you don't, then perhaps this is less relevant. But for me, because I made that choice, what I found is there are two sides to this. Number one, there's an emotional side. And number two, there's just a functional logistics side. On the emotional side, I have the benefit of having a partner who works in an incredibly demanding job likely similarly demanding to mine. Um, he really understands what my life and job is like every day. And he's actually the only person that understands both those things, what my life is like every day and what my job is like every day. Um, and so 
you know, all of our jobs are somewhat of an emotional roller coaster. We have some wins, we have some losses. Sometimes we have three of each in the same day. And when he tells me, hey, take an L for the day and you'll figure it out tomorrow, or don't quit, think of it this way. His advice has credibility because he actually understands and knows what I'm going through. And I think he's probably the only person that has that kind of credibility. Other people have good intentions and they have a sense of what you're going through, but they don't understand both sides. So from an emotional support perspective, there's nobody with more credibility. And by the way, he's usually right. I should listen more. Um, And then on the logistics piece, this is a function of having a child. The the prior piece is not. The, The biggest change, at least in our lives, of having a child is we now have like a thousand tiny little logistical decisions. Our daughter needs a flu shot. She can only wear these three colors to school. So let's make sure she has enough pants that are these three colors. Silly, tiny little decisions. What I've found is because I am not solely responsible for the thousand tiny decisions and there's someone to share the load with, I can be laser focused on work when it's my time to be laser focused on work. And when it's my time to be with my daughter, I'm able to do that as well. So just from being the emotional support as someone who understands it or splitting the work, right? Like being a family takes work. Having a supportive partner who has held my hand every day for the last 15 years has been just invaluable. That's so true. The cognitive load, I think, is what it's called, the cognitive load. So I agree very much with you about both the emotional and logistical part. But the thing that actually struck me in my relationship is also the relationship part. So what I've learned about marketing from my relationship to my wife or what I've learned, you know, from marketing to have a better relationship with my wife. And so, for example, we have a a free digital marketing course. And in the headline example section, Flint McLaughlin teaches, make the object of your headline the psychological driver of the offer. Right. So it's very true. And we're kind of getting into some of the psychological drivers and what you're talking about. Super. But then when you kind of think about it, like, okay, I'm having a conversation with my wife. We've got a big decision to make. Well, it's true. I kind of have to think about her psychological drivers too, right? Which might be very different from my own and and do that thing we talked about. Put yourself in the customer's shoes, Mm -hmm. which does not not come naturally in a relationship either. It's one of the hardest things to do because we're so, at least me, (laughs) I won't say about anyone else. I see the world as I see it, and I'm so set in my ways. So kind of learning that lesson, make the object of your headline the psychological driver of the offer. It's true for our marketing copy, but my gosh, it's true for every conversation I have with my wife about an important choice as well. So I wondered, that relationship aspect, is there anything you learned either from your marketing to be a better spouse and partner with your husband, or is there anything you learned from that relationship with your husband to be a better marketer? You know, One thing is provide context every time you tell a story. So Mm. in COVID, uh, prior to COVID, we we would see each other on the weekend only, basically. Uh, In COVID, we got to be in the same apartment every day, all day for about two years. And so we would, by nature, and we had our daughter in COVID. So by nature, we would talk more. Maybe those two changes kind of related. And what you learn really quickly when you're talking to someone outside your work life it, and you're explaining a work challenge or problem is they need more context. So it was a really good mental reminder to take back to work. Now, when I'm talking to my head of growth marketing about what our creative team is doing or what our creative director is considering an ask from our product marketing team, being able to bridge the gap between the different functions on the team and provide the context for what each person is doing or thinking is invaluable because that's actually what helps people to understand the why to get rallied around a specific cause or piece of creative or thing that we're making. And without that context, things fall down and they take longer and they're just less effective. So definitely one of the the lessons that I've remembered that came out of my personal life that influenced my work life is just context is the most critical thing because people understand the why once you explain it to them. And so true. And I also think you get the best thinking from your team because sometimes they're like, why the heck is the organization making that decision? It makes no sense. You know, and then when they get the context, they're like, oh, okay. You know, and maybe we add this or maybe we add that or, you know, um, very good point. So we talked about some lessons from the things you made in marketing. I want to talk about some of the lessons from some of the people you collaborated with because collaboration is so key to what we do. And this first lesson comes via Lorraine Hansen, the CMO of Chase. And you said your home life needs to have the infrastructure 
to support your work life. So how did you learn this from Lorraine and how did you build up this infrastructure? Yeah, so Lorraine uh, is the CMO of the Consumer Bank at Chase and she was my boss when I worked at Chase for the bulk of the time. And I became pregnant when I was at Chase and I had my daughter during my time there. And one of the first conversations I had with her about parenthood right after I told her I was pregnant was about how you create the infrastructure to make yourself successful, both at home and at work. You know, she, we were sitting in her office, I remember, uh, in, in Midtown in New York, and uh, I had just told her that I was pregnant, that I was going to have a little girl. And we started talking about how she manages it all because she has a family and she had a, 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 obviously a very large job and she was very successful at it. And what she told me is, hey, look, it's incredibly important to know two things. Number one, know that you don't know how you'll react when you become a parent. Perhaps your priorities will change. Feel comfortable that you you can't predict it. And the second was, if your work continues to fuel you, make sure that you have the infrastructure at home to let yourself be fully immersed in work when it is your time to be doing that. And I really took that to heart because as much as you and I can multitask, one of the things that some tiny bit of foresight I had about parenting before I became a parent was I'm pretty sure I can't multitask with like a child and a job at the same time. That just intuitively felt very difficult. And I know lots of parents were forced to do it, particularly in COVID, but because of her advice and understanding that to be true from the beginning of our daughter's life, we have maybe over, we've, we've created more infrastructure than needed so that we have a backup to the backup. So Our daughter goes to school. We have a nanny. We have the benefit of backup daycare. And the benefit of that is I'm typically not required to cancel things at the last minute because something has fallen through from a childcare perspective. I'm typically able to be laser focused on my job and pay attention because I know my daughter's in the right place. I'm not worried about her. She's learning. She's surrounded by kids. She's living a better life probably than, than I am, right? Doing like wonderful kid things. And I feel really good about that. So, you know, I, I got to publicly say thank you to Lorraine because she really was the catalyst for setting me up to figure out how to do that and to make space for being both a parent as well as a marketer. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that infrastructure, it's very true at home. And it's true at work too. And I think the biggest benefit i'm not perfect because i'm actually probably pretty bad at this but the biggest benefit when it's working well for me is like you said that laser focus because we notice this more with our kids like i know my daughters can tell like if you are not focused on them if you are not present in the moment they can tell and if you're distracted with something else especially about work they can tell and you're not really getting the most from that moment and it is this drive to productivity that makes us want to be like, okay, well, I think I can have a conversation with her about school while I'm going through my email, yeah. right? But I cannot, you know? And so, and I think that's, it's true at work too. The more I found, the more you can really lock in and focus on something, the more helpful it is. Because at the end of the day, as marketers, I don't think we're really measured by our productivity and the volume of our output. And I think this is a um, kind of a legacy idea we have from the days when the economy was mostly driven by manufacturing and farming and some of these things where it's like, how much output can we get that day, right? If we can get 10 out instead of nine out, it's a better day. We are driven by the originality and creativity of our ideas. And that takes focus. That takes your two hours in the morning where you're, you're writing. Maybe you don't even have a device, right? That takes that focus. And the same is true with raising our children. I got the, one of the best quotes I um, heard from a friend after going through COVID is um, realizing how much focus raising children really took. You know what I mean? He said, there's a lot of things where, you know, I was was just multitasking. I wasn't, you know, just, I wasn't locked into them. But at at COVID, I really had that time. And I said, okay, I'm working here. And then, wow, I'm totally focused on them. So um, I love what you say. And I'd really bring in that anytime someone can just lock in and focus, whether it's a concept at work, on a client, on a on an issue that an employee is facing, on your children, on your family, you're gonna be way more productive we're not as good multitaskers as we think. That said, don't stop from listening to this podcast while you're jogging or while, while you're commuting. That that you can multitask. But other than that, focusing on those ideas. Um, 
And the other thing we should focus in on is, as you mentioned previously, is that customer. Like, I love when you went out and actually, we you know, we're physically with customers when you try to put yourself in your customer's shoes. And that brings up this great lesson. Your customer is your most important stakeholder. You learn this from Imtiaz Patel, who is now the CEO of Baltimore Banner. And how did you learn this from Imtiaz? Yeah, so Imi was my first senior manager in my first job right out of undergrad. So imagine 21-year-old Radhika, newly minted college graduate, new Deloitte consultant. And our first project together was a store operations assessment at a major toy retailer. And what I was tasked with doing in my first few weeks was standing outside these toy stores and literally surveying people. I was the market research mechanism, for lack of a better way of putting it. And I would stand there with my clipboard and my pen, and I would ask people questions. But it was the dead of summer, like 100 degrees plus. I'm dressed like a management consultant, wearing like a scratchy skirt and high heels, because that's what you wore in 2005. Um, And I had a little bit of an ego about me. I was not pleased to be standing outside as a newly minted college graduate. I was a little bit like, why is this my job? And... Amy and I had the opportunity to fly back from somewhere together and we drove into the office together and I vividly remember this day. And what he said to me is, your customer is your most important stakeholder. Your company literally lives or dies based on their opinion because their opinion drives purchase. It just, it drives word of mouth, whether they share something negative or positive and your, you will, your business will go out of business or your client's business in the case where we were if you don't really understand what does a customer need, why will they choose you, and what can you do to be different from the competition? And I got to tell you, he was 100% right. And to this day, in every job I have worked in, I have championed the use of data and research to really understand our customers. So I shared an example from my current role at Super, where we all literally took a full day to walk in the shoes of our customers. When I worked at, I shared an example from Chase as well. When I worked at Common Bond, which was a student lender, we created a market research discipline in a very small company. We were at the time easily under a hundred people. And we had a robust research discipline that powered the product decisions we made simply because we wanted to make sure we were making the right choices that actually met the needs of our customers, not building products because we thought, oh, this was a cool feature or this was a cool tagline, and we're going to use that to market our products. So I, I, I cannot, you know, this is one of the things I bring with me in every role. And quite frankly, anytime I take a job, understanding leadership's focus on the customer is an incredibly important criteria for me. I, I, don't, I don't even want to take a job if there isn't care or thought to that question. So I want to key in on something you said about the product decisions. And if you have any advice or thoughts on when marketing should get out of its lane, so to speak, in terms of just in the marketing department and get involved with other departments to make sure we're serving the customer. Well, I interviewed uh, Cynthia Phillips, who is director of marketing at Rivet Software. And she put it this way. She said, marketers must be your company's corporate conscience. She advocated participating in matrix teams, getting involved in product decisions. So as, as marketers, I feel like we are the ones communicating the value prop. We're the ones communicating the brand. So I feel like it's on us to make sure that brand delivers, that we're communicating the right value proposition to do those beautiful things you talked about to really get to know and understand the customer. But if you had any experience, big companies, small companies, doesn't matter, of getting involved, of kind of getting outside your lane and, and how to effectively do that with your peers in, in other departments. Yeah, I think that common bond example is is a great one. So we literally stood up a research discipline uh, doing professional quality quantitative market research and maybe mediocre quality qualitative research um, in-house producing five to six studies a year simply because we wanted to make sure as we were innovating, we were creating the right products. And we did this with the agreement from the product team that understanding and hearing from our customers really did matter. So part of the stepping outside your lane is having alignment from the beginning. The a second thing that I've learned in my current role from our, from our head of product at Super is also how you do this, right? Really, really matters. The tone of voice you use, the examples that you, the specificity in the examples that you give, the data you provide also really matters. And 
what I've learned from both of those and other experiences is really, if you can come with data, if you can come with that open mind we discussed earlier, and if you can come with specific examples or a specific need, everyone is typically in it to solve the same problem. And folks are receptive, particularly if you're coming with those three things, because they all want to, we all want to get to the same endpoint or the same solution. Well, let's, let's talk about that role at, at Super for a minute, because you did something that really does involve, I think, in an in ideal world, getting the entire company involved, and that's rebranding, right? I think it was uh, Snap Commerce, rebranding the Super. Uh, and so I want to get into that, like, how you involved customer understanding, how you involved the rest of the organization, and also how you settled on what you would rebrand to. Because, you know, as I was mentioning, it struck me as kind of funny, um, the name Super, uh, you know, it's you you bought super.com, you own the URL, but it's a it's a general name and there are certain struggles with general names. Like on the one hand, it's great. It's that traditional brand building. We're gonna build around super. This is perfect. On the other hand, uh, for example, we have a publication called Marketing Experiments. There's great keywords, it's a great name, but as a general term, it, there's certain practicalities that are difficult. It's it's hard to find media mentions. It's hard to find social media mentions unless people actually at mention us. Um so I wonder kind of what some of the thinking went in there, how'd you get the rest of the organization involved? And um, yeah, if you can kind of jump into some of that. Yeah, so I think you asked three questions and I can answer each of them. Your first question was... So thorough, listen to how thorough Radhi is. I'm just mumbling <laughs> on here and she broke down exactly what I was asking. I could see the success from Deloitte to here, but go on, go on. <laughs> I, there are a lot of folks that taught me how to do that at Deloitte, so kudos to them. <laughs> um, three questions, right? The first was, how did you get the rest of the organization involved? And, and this is the point where we should take a pause and I should just very clearly say every single person at Super was involved in our rebrand and it's not possible without them. And I shouldn't speak about it in the past tense because we rebranded last week and there are things, <laughs> right, that we are all troubleshooting every single one of us together. And so how do you involve the rest of the organization is, is a good question. So I think you involve the rest of the organization in, in a couple of different ways. First, declaring a vision for what a rebrand is and sharing the process. So what is the outcome and what is the process is something that we have been doing all year at Super. We've been sharing with the whole company in our full company meetings, what do we want the outcome to be? And what are the steps it takes to get there? And making sure people actually understand that I think is the first step. Then getting really tactical with different groups of people is really important. So we have a really, we had a really strong project management kind of cadence and office uh, run by one individual on the product team who kept us on track uh, and, and kept us together and made sure every team and every person on that team knew what their role was within that bigger mission um, and knew what part of the outcome they were supposed to drive. So renaming a company, particularly a company that's not 10 people and a million dollars in revenue so a size, re- renaming a sizable company really does take the full organization. It takes vision. It takes communication. And it, very, it takes very clear tactical organization. The second thing you asked is... Just real well, quick, about, before we jump into that second. Yeah. So give us just a sense. Three months, nine months, like how long was this project for? We started January 25th, and we rebranded October 18th. Okay, great. Um. Were we ready to rebrand? We were ready to rebrand, call it two-ish months earlier, probably. But we wanted to couple our rebrand with our amazing product launch. um, And and that was the right decision for us. So rebranding is not a a quick process. And one of the things that's so interesting is, you know, the process to pick the name and to create the verbal and visual identity is, is one kind of thing. But to actually transition to that new brand and be that new brand, you know, transition your email addresses, transition your domain, transition your paid marketing, make sure that your crunch base profile says super and not snap snap commerce, the thousand little details, that's not going to be done for a long, long, long time. So there are always new kind of things that we're finding. And very tactically, what we do is we have a spreadsheet that uh, I believe is named rebrand feedback. And every day, twice a day, I have 10 minutes on my calendar and I go in, the whole company inputs feedback into that spreadsheet. I triage and I say, okay, person X, please help me with this one. Or, oh, I can solve this one. Let me go do that. And we're still doing that because this is going to take some time 
And to the point of the whole organization being behind us, we're going to need every person's help because some of these, some of these things require different skill sets. Absolutely. So that's important of the project management part. And thanks for, thanks for bringing that in. But let's talk about that creative part, how you settle on the name. So, you know, I was joking. It seemed like there was a movement like, okay, we're going to make up these words. There was Altria, there was Accenture, right? And now there's a movement to kind of move towards more general words and then the traditional brand building behind there. And I was joking, I think with your, with your team, that if Apple were named today, I think the SEO consultants would say, wait, Steve, 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 that, that's the wrong semantic keyword. Google's going to think we're, you know, a produce company. And so there's this other, you know, approach to take where it's very, very keyword driven and we're going to own these right keywords. And so I want to ask, how, how did we get to super? Because super, again, it's a very general term. You've got the URL now. We went from Snap Commerce to super. How did we get there? Yeah, so we, we took a couple of different steps. The first thing we did is, we work, by the way, we worked with a wonderful agency that helped us to, to come up with this. And the first thing we did is, with them, they helped us create guidelines for what a name that we would like and move forward with could be. Now, remember... I'm probably in month two while we are doing this. So it's very, in this moment in time, it was very clear to me that this wasn't my baby and this was the baby of our two co-founders. So making sure that the two of them were the ones that were actively creating the guidelines and had a clear voice in that process was incredibly important. But with our agency mapping out, what are the guidelines? An example of a guideline, by the way, like, what does that mean? An example of a guideline is, is it a real word that already exists today? Or is it a word that we make up? Is it one syllable or could it be longer? Um, is it a person's name or is it not a person's name, right? Just very clear tactical guidelines. And we had a list of maybe five of them. One of those guidelines, by the way, to your point was, it was a real word that already existed. Our co-founders both felt very strongly about that. They wanted people to know how to pronounce it and they wanted people to know how to spell it. After we had those guidelines with the agency, we had several rounds of ideation. I believe they did three rounds of ideation, we opened it up to our whole company and folks provided their thoughts and suggestions and importantly, the why behind their suggestions. Um, and then we did research. We did both quant and qual research. And we really just wanted to understand what do consumers think of these names? What feeling or emotion do these names evoke in our consumers? And ultimately we chose the name based on the results of the qual, the results of the quant, the results of how our two co-founders really felt, what they ultimately also liked and felt that like they, they could kind of stand behind. And I got to tell you, the outcome, I really like because the outcome is, is the way we want our consumers to feel every day when they use our product. We want our consumers to feel super. And by the way, that is the unmet need. Our consumers don't feel super every day. And we want to be the one to help to bridge that gap. And I really like being able to say that out loud. I think that's a very easy, very simple to understand story. And it clearly places our role as empowering them to feel that way. That's great. I think that's a great explanation of really the art and the science that are involved in a rebranding, right? There's the qual and the quant data and that stuff. At the end of the day, like you say, you got to be on board. You got to want to talk about it. You got to have the founders on board. Let me ask about one specific guideline. Uh, you have super.com now. You own it now. Was that mandatory for the name that you had to own the .com or did that just kind of come along with the rebranding? No, it wasn't mandatory. And in fact, we talked about it a little bit um, and we said it wasn't mandatory that the .com was available. Over time, once we had landed on Super and we were building out the verbal and the visual identity, we were trying to figure out how to obtain the .com and just trying to understand if it was possible. And what we started to realize is if we could be the super, the one that had super.com, it would lend us a tremendous amount of credibility. And that credibility would match the history that we had as a company. We didn't start last week. We just rebranded last week. And being able to say that we are super.com, you can kind of see it in the eyes of investors, in the eyes of journalists. Even a consumer, like a potential consumer, has, had said to me, oh, you're super.com. So that means something. Let's talk about next lesson now, which I can tell you're living in the way you talk about the rebranding, but applies to many things. Have conviction and then don't give up. So you learned this from Satish Dugal, who is your father, who is the CEO of Twin Tier Hospitality. So how did you learn this from your dad? Yeah, so 
I think my dad taught me this every day for the last 39 years. Um, but it's so interesting. He came across this lesson in his career. So he is someone who spent about 20 years working at a big company, Corning Incorporated. And I, he felt he was frequently passed over for new opportunities or promotions or credit that he deserved. But he had real conviction in his ability to get things done and to be successful and to make the right decisions. And because of that, he took calculated but substantial risks to start his own business. And that business wound up employing a couple thousand people. And it led to good success for him and, and, and ultimately powered our lives as a family. And one of the things he said to me using that example, hey, I believed in myself. I knew I could do this. So I went out and did it and I never gave up. And I really draw on that a number and I have a number of times throughout my career. A great example is, is now here at Super. So by the way, you can't have conviction in, in everything and never give up on everything because you, you, your life wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Um, you don't have the mind space for that. But the one or two or three things you really care about, those are the things I really don't give up on. So a great example is what we're doing today as part of our rebrand. So we have created what we call the rewritten rules of the game of life. So I'm going to take a step back. If anyone's a parent, uh, you, you may have played the board game, the game of life. And if you've recently taken out the rule book and taken a peek at it, you'll realize that it may not be grounded in reality of everyday life. So for example, in the game of life, every player starts with $200,000. The close to 70% of Americans have less than $1,000 in the bank. This is readily available research. Uh, so certainly the game of, real, of life is not grounded in reality in some ways. So what we did is we took that rule book, the digital PDF, we scratched out the things that didn't make sense. We used real data and facts and we annotated the rule book to say, okay, close to 70% of Americans don't have $1,000 in the bank. This one's wrong. Or one of the decisions is about choosing to go to college and, or choosing to get a job and having equal outcomes. We scratched out that and made it very clear what the real data is. And we rewrote all the rules. And the goal of this is to get journalists to open their eyes to this problem and use their megaphone as journalists to scream from every rooftop possible that things are unequal and disparate in our country. And we've got to focus on solving some of these financial problems. And I got to admit, it's, it's not working in the way that we wanted it to. And that's okay. I have conviction that this type of content that helps to amplify the problem we're trying to solve is the exact right content for our brand to be creating for press because we need them to help explain the problem to other consumers, to other VCs, to other groups that can help partner with us to solve the problem. So what are we doing? We're not scrapping this thing and throwing it away. We're doubling down on it. And we are figuring out how do we pivot? What are new channels we can use to distribute this? What are different ways we can get consumer eyes on it? What are different ways we can get press eyes on it? I think this is the right content for us. I have conviction that this is what is going to help us open the eyes of journalists and others to the problem we're trying to solve. And that ultimately will help us get further faster. So we're doubling down on it. And I'll let you know in a quarter or two how it goes. Well, good for you. I think one of the challenges in the digital world is we move so fast, we also kind of give up so fast. You know what I mean? Like when I, earlier in my career, you know, I talked about it was more print advertising, these bigger budgets. It was these things that naturally took a longer time frame and you kind of had to just stick to it longer. You, you just naturally had to because it was this long arc you're looking at. And with digital information, even digital, digital PR, just digital advertising, we get such quick information and feedback, we can sometimes pivot too quickly. And I was interviewing earlier on the, the podcast, the CMO of Dashlane, and he talked about being at eBay and making this decision, I think it took two or three years before it paid off. Like, but he just hit it and hit it and hit it because he knew it was the right thing and kind of seeing that to fruition. So good for you for, I think it's a lesson we can all learn from of sometimes, even though we're, we're getting that early data, we have to decide 
what is that value proposition we want in the world? And that's kind of what I want to ask you about is, it seems like what you're talking about with Super is a mission-driven company, right? It seems like there's a certain value proposition, a certain mission. So what role does that play in the communication you're putting out there, right? Because what you're talking about now, this is a very high-level PR story. It's a bigger story than or super.com and you can save money. So what role does that play in how you balance your budget, your investment, your communication to get the mission out there versus to get the direct response conversion out there of getting more monthly active users? Yeah, so I'd say you have two, two types of resources. You have people time and you have money and you have different audiences, by the way. So consumers are our most important audience. Then we have press, then we have investors, then we have employees. I'm not stack ranking the importance of different groups. I'm just listing them. And there's probably others as well. And the way I like to think about this is you have to think about which of your two precious resources should be deployed against which audience and what is the right message for every single one of those audiences. So for example, for consumers, we do have a really strong direct response practice and we try to reach consumers through that type of marketing and it works for press. However, we don't focus on throwing a lot of money at press. It's just a different game, right? The message is different. The tactics are different and the investment, the investment is the investment in people time for employees. For example, it's the same thing. The, it, this isn't necessarily a high cost game, but the message is different for employees than it is for consumers. And the investment is different. So I think it's really important when you think about balancing messaging and audience and resources to really map out who are your primary audiences, what are the resources you have to devote to each, and what is the investment level of each, and then what is the messaging? It actually is different. If you make that table, you'll find that all of those levers are levers you can pull to get to an end goal with each audience, but it's different for each. And does the customer journey kind of overall funnel fit into that? Because I'd imagine, you know, if you just go straight to the boom monthly active user, there's, there's probably a message there, right? You can save money. But is there also thinking of that overall funnel of like, okay, it needs to start where before any change can happen, before any transformation can happen, people need to picture the, the ability or the possibility of that. And then we're driving down to like, okay, here's how we actually pay it off with a product. Yeah. And actually you mentioned the customer journey. I think there's a different message for every single one of those stakeholders at the different points in their journey. So how you might speak to a reporter that you've never met and that you're trying to form a relationship with is very different from a reporter that you know that you are simply trying to get them to write something about a timely topic or how you might speak to a candidate that's for the first time learning about Super, the company that was named a week ago, is really different than how you might speak to a candidate who you've been nurturing for some time. So I do agree with you. I think that where someone is in their journey really does impact the message. It impacts the way you invest your resources as well. But it's not just specific to consumers. It's any audience that you're trying to reach. Absolutely. They can all be customers. Investors are possible customers. You've got internal mm -hmm. customers. I, I totally agree. Well, Arnica, we covered so many different things about what it means to be a marketer, both in our professional lives and in our personal lives. Thanks for being transparent there. So if you had to break it down, what are the key qualities of an effective marketer? So I think a couple of really important things that an effective marketer needs to have. Number one, they need to be data-driven. It's actually one of our overall company core values. So I'd say actually, regardless of your profession, be data-driven. The second is care for customers and a desire to understand that. You've heard me talk about that countless times over the last, call it, hour. I cannot say that enough. Care about who you're solving for. And the third is understand the goals of the business and make sure every solution you put forth, whether you are a first-year analyst or you are the CMO, is grounded in the reality of the business. Well, thank you, Radhika. Great advice. I've learned so much over the past hour. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks to everyone for listening. I hope you learned a lot as well. Thank you for joining us for How I Made It in Marketing with Daniel Burstein. Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A.com. Marketing
Thank you.